Hey, this is Big and Rich, and this is a disclaimer for tonight's show. Yeah, normally we try not to discuss politics or religion in our post-show comments. It, either in a negative or a positive way. We just it, yeah, It's too divisive. We want to steer subject. clear of it just because it's easy to make someone angry that way. And so we try not to talk. Today we touch on it. I don't know that we touch on it too much or too divisively, but after recording it, we thought, you know what, maybe we better let people know that there's the possibility that they could be offended by what we say. And so we just wanted to let you know about that now so that when the story's over, you can just skip. You can just not bother with it this time if you're one of those people that might be offended by those things. Right. Our show isn't scripted. We just wing it. We start it recording and talk about the first thing that jumps into our head. That should be obvious no. how bad they are sometimes. But I'm, I'm just oh, saying oh, sorry. that we didn't seek out to offend anybody's sensibilities or support anybody's sensibilities. It was just a natural progression of topics on this. So if, if you're worried that you'll think less of us or that we think less of you for whatever beliefs or, or stance you have, then as soon as the story's over, go on to the next show. You've been warned. Thanks. Take it away, announcer man. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Welcome to the Broken Mirror Story Event. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. I don't like spam! And Rish Outfield. Don't make a fuss, dear. I love your spam. I love it. Hear ye, hear ye, the Honorable Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is now in session. Episode 88. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. Thanks for joining us once again. Today, we finally have gotten around to the first of our contest winners. Was it a contest? It was, it was, a, it was a competition. Competition. Our special competition winners... The winners of the Broken Mirror Story event. Today's story is Sinesis and the Ass King. Oh, wait, sorry. Sinesis and the Ash King by Lizanne Hurd. These were all stories that were written based on a premise that we gave as, as a contest. You know, hey, write a story under this premise. And everybody sent them in. And this was one of our triumphant finalists. Finalists. Oh, good word. Because, you know, there's something ominous about the word final. Yeah. What we're going to put on the actual show is the three top stories. These are the three stories that got the top marks from our illustrious crew of slush readers. And I will be doing them for the next three episodes. So first off is Lizanne Hurd's story, Sinesis? Sin, 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 sinus cavity. Sin, sin, Santa Claus. Sa, sa, s, I do want to say Satan, don't I? Sinesis and the ass. Dang. Sinesis and the ash king. Maybe no. it's Sinise ass and the ash ass. Anyways, Lizanne Hurd has been writing and illustrating speculative fiction for the last five years. She's had stories and art published in Toasted Cheese Literary Magazine, Expanded Horizons, Clone Pod, <laughs> The Drabblecast, and of course, the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Check out her art at The Big Purple Couch, which is her website, or at her blog. We'll have links to those in the show notes. We'd also like to thank R.E. Chambliss for producing today's episode. Uh, she also did a voice on today's episode, as well as Rhonda Carpenter, Marion Rich, and Ken Crawford. And today's music is by Kevin McLeod. You can check out the links in the show notes for those as well. Sinesis and the Ash King by Lizanne Hurd The river receded again that spring, four years in a row, and it meant one thing. King Yuntan had lost favor with God and his wife, and another king must be chosen. He had been Ash King for a good long time. For 38 years he had maintained favor, and the village prospered. Their trade was busy, their gardens burst with success, and the children were plentiful. 
Yes, 38 years had been good to Yuntan and the people of Boron. They had been good until the river started to recede. What have you done? Asked Sindri, his advisor. You have done something terrible, no doubt. Look at this river, he said, pulling Yuntan by the sleeve to look at the muddy banks and quiet water. The spirit of your wife is gone. <laughs> Sindri spat onto the ground. She would not leave if you treated her well. Yuntan looked up and down the thinning water. She had gone. That was clear. She no longer loves me, he said, almost to himself. Then tell me, Yuntan, what did you do? She loved you and blessed you with a good life all these years, only to leave now? Yuntan had his back to Sindri. If she does not return, they will choose another king. You will become a sad old man, and I will have to train another child, God curse you. He tried to spit again, but his mouth was dry. I went to visit my sister in Deodar, said Yuntan, his back still to Sindri. I stayed with her only a few days. That was many years ago. She had a maid servant. Sindri was silent, going over the times in his head. Yuntan had visited his sister five years before. He closed his eyes and bent his head. Is there a child? Yuntan turned to look at Sindri. Isn't there always? He walked back up the path to his home, leaving Sindri to work out their fate. The meeting at the Grange was subdued, mothers clutching their daughters and grooming their sons. Even Sindri's own daughter was draped in an ashen gray frock, restitched and patched from years of attempted camouflage. His wife, Kalendra, covered with the symbols of her family's trade, hid four-year-old Sinisa's in the folds of her voluminous skirt. Other mothers did likewise. Kalendra fussed with her medallions and bracelets and twisted her rings around her fingers until they were warm. The ring spell, she hoped, would cover Sinisa's with obscurity. She looked over to Sindri, who was busy finding places for the latecomers, but his eyes looked old and tired. She had married him when he was already an old man next to the king. Sinisa's made him young again. She tried not to look at the child, keeping her as secret as possible. Sleep, she thought to her daughter. She could feel the girl's body relax and become heavy against her legs. Boys ran around the grange, clomping their sandals and shouting. They were regaled in bright colors, their faces painted with cheery cheeks and feminine eyes. They were beautiful birds, raucous and bold. Kalendra eyed their mothers with jealousy, who fussed over and preened their sons. Even if their child was chosen, they would not lose him. He would be king for as long as he was favored. He would lose nothing but his heritage, since he would be wed to a ghost. Just not my ghost, thought Kalendra. She resisted the temptation to pet Sinisa's sleeping head. Sindri found seats for the last arrivals and looked around. Nearly every villager was there, except for the ill, the feeble, and the king. People! He shouted, trying to subdue the clamor. We must begin! Parents collected their boys, who continued to squirm and protest in their father's laps. Sindri drew in breath through tight lips, disgusted. He kept his back to Kalendra. From a cubby within the Grange wall, he pulled a leather bag, heavy with smooth, flat stones. From the center of the large room, he spoke the rules of the drawing. Our king has lost favor in the eyes of his wife. Her spirit, which was shared equally among those of us on the day she was chosen, has left the village and taken the blessings of God with her. Our king, Yuntan, must be replaced. Today we will choose our new Ash King and his wife, whose spirit will bring the favor of God upon us once again. Glory be to God and his handmaiden, came the responsorial. Boys, come to me. The parents thrust forward their boys, some barely able to walk, and others old enough to look sheepishly for their girlfriend's hidden faces, knowing they would never again touch a soft breast if they selected the Ash King's stone. They pressed in to Sindri. One by one, they pulled out the stones. 
He whispered something into each ear, and they nodded, covering the stone with both hands as they took a seat around him on the floor. Twenty-seven boys, each holding a stone. The Ash King's stone, said Sindri, will match only one. He reached into the bag and produced one more stone, hidden in the hem of the bag. Holding it up between two fingers, it looked new, just created by God. It had a simple swirl of hieroglyph on one side, the symbol of the Ash King, a man engulfed by a spirit. He turned around slowly so that each boy could see the symbol. As they compared their stone to the king's stone, mixed sighs of relief and envy rippled through the assembly. It isn't mine, said one boy. Tears welled up in his eyes and streaked his makeup as he slumped back to clearly disappointed parents. Mine either, said another. Mine either. And another. Tiny squeals of happiness flittered through the coverings of the young girls as their boyfriends returned to them, unkinged. Barely more than halfway through the boys, Sindri grew tired. How to make this last? He asked himself. How not to select a queen? He slowed down to a toddler's pace, hoping with each stone it would again not match the king's. He pinched his eyes against the thoughts of his beautiful Sinisas, the child of his old age. It's mine! He heard the shout nearly in his ear, so loud he opened his eyes and threw back his head like he'd been hit. A roar billowed out from the crowd, and the boy's parents led the surge into the middle of the room. Graham, only ten years old, held the Ash King's stone at arm's length above his head, bouncing within the circle of pressed villagers. I'm the new Ash King! The boy shouted again. He was lifted off the ground and carried on many shoulders. They presented him with quick bouquets and a shower of praise. The musicians jumped into a quick melody of celebration. Graham! Graham the Ash King! May he live forever! Sindri stood off to the side while the noise died down. The children sat with their parents, and Graham, still giddy from his good fortune, danced and giggled in his own chair, center. One of the mothers, of only sons, mind you, looked from the crowd and back to Sindri. They were still fidgety and murmuring, but ready to go on. She leaned over her eldest son, adult by any measure, and the town's good fortune that he had not been chosen, and pulled at Sindri's jacket. Sindri! He barely took notice, one knuckle touching his lips, eyes pinched tight. Sindri, we've a king. Pick us a queen. Most of the crowd echoed yes, the woman's a demand. Queen. Yes, a queen. Others held their breath and looked down, hating their neighbors. They tried to hide the girls, for what little good it would do. A queen would be chosen from among them. Each mother hoped that God would not look upon their daughter for this Pyrrhic blessing. Sindri could not look into their eyes, so he focused on the feet encircling the grange. He kept his back to Calendra, although he could feel her heart beating in his head. It matched the rhythm of his own heart. He cleared his throat, but his voice still broke when he began. <clears throat> no king should rule alone. Instead, we give him a queen. Her perfection will be upon us and in us. As long as the king remains true, she will remain as guardian of us all and bring God's kind grace to this town. Glory be to God and his handmaiden. Girls, come to me. This time, no one pressed in. The girls came slowly. The older ones were crying and making the little ones nervous. Soon, most of them were in tears. The littlest ones tried to run back to the arms of their mothers, only to have their fathers pick them up and carry them to the center of the room. Sindri could see the mothers with their faces hidden in their skirts. Without looking behind him, he knew that Kalendra did not bury her face. He could still hear her desperate voice in his head. She was not angry, not yet. He felt two arms clasp him about the knees. Pick me up, Daddy, said Sinisus. She held up one arm, the other not letting go of his pant leg. Please? I'm sorry, love, he said. Daddy's doing something. He reached into the cubby and pulled out a second leather bag, this one as ornate as the girls' dresses were drab. He counted out 32 stones, one for each girl. 32. The odds were good. The queen's stone will match only one. He held out the bag and the girls each took a stone. 
none hurried to look at theirs, and his whisper that they hold them between their two palms was almost unnecessary. The stone Sindri took from the bag's hem was elaborately carved with swirls of wind spiraling between the eye of God and the body of a man. It was beautiful, carved into a deep black stone with surprising heft for such a small item. One by one, he coaxed the girls to show their stones. Not mine. The first girl quavered. She fell to her knees, palms outstretched, and sobbed with relief. (laughs) Her parents ran forward and pulled her back into their embrace. Sindri checked the stone in the hand of another child, Ella, who was even younger than his own Sinisa's. Let me see, little one, he coaxed. Her fingers were white around the rock. Is that a black rock you have there, Ella? Stop, you coward, cried Ella's mother. She doesn't have the stone. It's not hers. Please, it's not hers. Her voice trailed off as she pressed her head into the shoulder of her husband. Sindri looked back at Ella, who was biting her lip and knitting her little brow beneath her bangs. Let me see. He unlocked her fingers and revealed the black stone. The side of the stone facing him was blank. Sindri closed his eyes and prayed a brief second and turned it over in her palm. The symbol was that of a shepherd, not a spirit queen. He bent his head and stood. Petting her on the head, he sent Ella back into the crowd to her parents. One by one, each of the other girls did the same, revealed the stone, sank back in relief, and ran back to their parents. Thirty girls checked. Only two left. Jensa and Sinesis. Their eyes were huge and wet, and they looked for all the world like the twins whose tears filled the river. Sindri heard his wife's voice in his head. Just do it, Sindri. We've waited long enough. (sighs) He breathed deep and let it out slow through his nose, lips pinched tight. On his knees, he beckoned Sinisa's to him, and she nearly fell into his chest. Daddy! she shouted, nestling her chin into his neck. Slowly, he pulled back. Taking her hands into his own, he cupped them, kissed their soft pudginess, and slowly pulled them apart. The stone was black. A murmur twittered through the crowd. Jensa leaned over, trying to catch a glimpse. Sindri opened his daughter's hands fully to expose the hieroglyph. He saw the spirit shape, the occluded woman's shape, his future falling away. Quickly, he recovered the stone with Sinisa's hand. It was clear to him that Jensa had not seen the glyph, and Sinisa's did not know what it meant. If I just say it's not hers, he thought to himself, my own Sinisa's will be safe. He covered her hands, obfuscating their contents from the eyes of the crowd. The stone was dark, not black, but the glyph was of a young flute player. Yes, he thought to himself, No one will be the wiser. He looked at Jensa with sad compassion and reached to lift her up, announcing her as queen. Sinesis has it, a voice shouted from behind him. Her stone is black. Whirling around, he saw it, Sinesis holding out the stone to the crowd, clearly displaying her death sentence, the glyph of the queen. The room seemed to pull away from him now. He grabbed Sinesis, held her into his chest, and ran to Calendra. They rocked and sobbed, voices and tears, the sounds of the musician's celebration melting into one blanket of noise. The dedication of the queen brought a representative of each household. Each would witness the ceremony to make sure it was done. Calendra looked outside her window at them, gathering by the fire pit in the square just before the bend in the road. She closed the curtain and spat on the floor. Sinisa's was still holding the stone. She twirled in her ceremonial gown, the brightest colored cloth she'd ever seen, much less worn. I did what I could, Calendra. You must believe me. She touched his face, the furrows and sags having grown deeper since morning. Papery and dry, the trail of tears having since been erased. Pulling him close, she kissed him, dry on dry. We both did, love. She looked over at her daughter. 
We both will, if we must. What? Shh, she said. On the counter by the window was a small cup, the one Sinisa's used each meal. Calendra picked it up and carried it to her cupboard of elixirs. Tiny bottles, little boxes, herbs, and medicinals. She had small measures available for anyone who needed them. And today, of all days, Sinisa's needed them. She will feel no pain. She mixed up what she needed. A few herbs, something dark and thick like autumn knotweed honey, and a powder Calendra would not touch with her bare fingers. Into the cup and served with juice, and then to the hands of Sinisa's. Drink up, baby, she said. And the child did, even licking the sticky sides of the cup when the liquid was gone. The fire was already starting to settle back from its initial burst when Sindri and Kalendra brought out Sinisa's. She had her arms draped on her father's neck, and her mother held onto the fingertips of the girl's right hand behind Sindri's back. She was wide awake and calm. The crowd split for their entry. Mostly men circled the fire. A few teenagers came to gawk, a handful of women, even Yuntan, who had been drinking. The sky was dark, so this little circle was all that was left to the world, as far as any of them could tell. The fire was so bright. Graham was thrust forward, still grinning. In his hands, he had the bandanas and a black embroidered bag. Here, he said, giving them over to Sindri. You must help me, son. This is your wife. The one to whom you are dedicated for the rest of your life. You are to bind her as she is bound to you. No one else can ever take her place in your heart or in your bed. Sindri cast a sideways glance toward Yuntan, who was looking at his hands. Do you understand, Gram? I am the Ash King, he replied. Together, Gram and Sindri bound Sinisa's, who, although alert, did not resist. Here, said Sindri as Graham tied her wrists. Not too tight. She's just a baby. Graham loosened the knot, and Sinisa smiled at him. They bound her wrists, her legs, and a gentle angle knot to bring them together. The bandanas matched her gown, beautiful gauzy colors wrapped around her tiny limbs. Before you cover her face, Graham, you must kiss her. Graham curled his lip and backed up just a step. He gave a tiny whimper of disgust. Ew. You are the Ash King, Graham. The fate of our village rests on your faithfulness to this child, your queen. Graham looked around for support, but the people pushed him forward. Sindri spat on the ground. (laughs) I've seen you kiss miserable curs in your yard. Surely you can spare a kiss for the wife who sacrifices everything for you. He pulled Graham over by his collar, forcing the boy to walk on tiptoes. He relented, bent over the face of Sinisa's, and pecked her on the cheek. He was about to wipe his mouth, but stopped with one look at Sindri's expression of fury hidden beneath the grief. That being done, the crowd relaxed just a bit and pulled back. The fire was just right now, and several of the men produced the pyre bed, metal framed filigree covered with pillows and flowers. It was all they could do to place their only child on the bed. It was nearly impossible for Sindri to help Graham place the embroidered bag over her head. Neither of them could bear to watch as she was placed over the fire, and she was consumed. The fire took her quickly. The medicine Kalendra had given her made it painless for Sinisa's. But Kalendra and Sindri's hearts were broken beyond measure. They held each other close. Even as the rest of the town left one by one, they stayed. Even as Ash King Graham was led away to prepare for the morning's final ceremony, they stayed. When the last of the red embers faded to brown, then black, they stayed. It was very dark, not quite dawn yet, when they stirred. Sinisa's ashes lay in the middle of the fire pit. Just after daybreak, the coroner would come and collect the ash, ready to distribute to the king and the town. I'm staying said Kalindra. Just a few minutes more. You go. I'll be in. She sent her husband into the house. 
She joined him just as the sun was rising. Overnight, she had become old. Just days before, she moved like a breeze over meadow flowers. Now she walked as if on coals. Her dark, thick hair, the crown of her beauty, had become gray and matronly. She had even pulled it up into a bun, like the crones did. Sindri pulled her close. I'm so sorry, my love. He reached to touch her hair, to pull out the crone's bun. No, Sindri, leave it. I am in mourning. Everyone should see my grief while they all celebrate their Ash King and Queen. Now the entire town gathered. The coroner had collected the ash from the pit. Each bit was secured in the large bowl of his profession, mixed with water and just a bit of clover syrup to make it easier. He served Graham first. You are the Ash King, said Sindri. Through you and with you will the queen reign. Take this and eat, letting her wisdom and her connection with God guide you. Graham took the smaller bowl and raised it to his lips. After a brief pause, he gulped down the ashen drink in one swig. He was given bread to clean out what remained, and ate that as well. A cup of river water, a celebratory refrain from the musicians, and Graham was king. Each person present followed suit. The line was long, and Sindri sat next to Calendra on one of the rock walls lining the square. We have to do this, love. If we don't... Yes, love, she said. They both rose, and the line took them in, the broken father and the graying mother. When it was over, the pit emptied and the Ash King properly trumpeted and festooned, Sindri and Kalendra turned up the street, back to their lifeless house. I cannot stay here. Yes, of course. No, I mean it, Sindri. This town has taken our daughter. I cannot stay here. Sindri looked out the window at the town, which now belonged to a ten-year-old king and his dead daughter. It seemed strange and foreign. The road was empty, with the ceremony done and mealtime approaching. A few dogs sought shelter from the afternoon sun. We'll leave today. This house is empty without her. He pressed back the tears from his eyes. Looking at Calendra, her eyes were dry and her jaw set. I have family in Deodar. They need a woman of medicine there. It rained that night. The journey was less than a day by carriage, but it was open to the air and it was getting cold. Help me, said Calendra as the first drops fell. Cover me. She handed Sindri a large blanket. It was smooth, with hardly a nap. Her face and hair covered, she relaxed into her husband's arms. It was well into morning as they arrived at the edge of Deodar, its rock wall entrance low and in shambles. The town's fortune had been declining for years, longer even than their own town. But Deodar had abandoned the tradition of an ash king. They let their children live, and God make do as he will. Here, said Calendra, as they pulled up by a low row of houses. This one is my cousin's house. He will take us in. She removed the covering on her head, folding it carefully, tucking it into one of her bags. He'll be home, love. She took Sindri's hand, and they knocked. Paolo answered the door. Calendra! Oh, darling, it is so good to see you. He pulled in his cousin, and she dropped her bags onto the floor. Sindri followed behind. What brings you here? There is no wedding, no funeral. He glanced over at Sindri. You are Sindri, yes? He took the older man's hands and shook them like an old friend. It's good to have you here. Please, come in. He looked from face to face, trying to read them. So tell me, why are you here? Sindri took a step forward. We've decided to... The town took Sinezas as their ash queen. Calendra's eyes were wide with meaning. She grabbed Paolo's hands. Oh, well then. He looked back at Sindri. Yes, I see. He moved back toward the kitchen, which passed through to the enclosed garden. Come, follow me. 
Calendra picked up the bag with the blanket and her medicinals. The bottles made muffled clinking noises as they crossed the threshold from the kitchen into the garden. A large fountain with a waiting pool dominated the center of the garden. Paolo looked through the bag. It is here. You did bring it, I assume. Wait, what is going on here? Calendra, please, t tell me what's going on. It'll be fine, my love. Everything will be fine. She touched Paolo's shoulder. It's not in the bag, Paolo. Stand up. He did. Look at me. He did this as well. I've got her here. She pointed to her hair. Sindri looked at his wife. Not gray with sudden age. Not old with the loss of her child. What is it, love? What did you do? Help me, Paolo. She pulled a large bottle from her bag and handed it to her cousin. I made as much as I could. He took a large knife from the kitchen and cut open the top of the bottle with one strike. Some of the liquid dripped out over the pool of water, and he poured the rest in. She untied her hair from the crone's bun, and it cascaded down her back. She kneeled over the rim of the pool's low stone edge and waited as the water churned the liquid evenly throughout the water. She beckoned over Sindri. Forgive me, Sindri. I killed a dog yesterday. She looked into the face of her husband. The town's queen is a dog. With that, she bent her head into the water. Ash, pounds of ash, came filtering out of the dark tresses, mixing with the fountain's water and the liquid Paolo had poured in. Her hair became dark and young. The pool water became gray and thick. The last of the clear fountain water rinsed her hair clean, and she stood. Now it's just time. As the water churned, the gray became pink, thick and discreet. Something coagulated within the ripples, thrashing and birthing itself in the pool. The three of them watched as a pink little girl, so recently dust, was risen again. She blinked once, her wet little head bobbing above the surface. Mommy! Daddy! She sputtered, just afraid enough. Rushing to her, they lifted her reborn body and held her close. And now, a word about today's story. Sinesis and the Ash King came about from me hearing about a story of a prisoner who was out on leave. And every time he went out on leave, when he came back, they would check that to see if he had any drugs, and he didn't. But yet, every night after he came back, he would be high on something. And they couldn't figure out for weeks how he was getting drugs. And it turned out that he was putting the drugs in his hair and rinsing it out in the sink and then collecting it and drying it. And then he was able to take the drugs then. And that image stayed with me for decades. I've had this idea for 15, 20 years. And then finally, when the contest came around, I'm going, well, how am I going to put something interesting in this story, a nice twist? And that's when I came up with, well, if the girl has to die and the mother can get her back, this was a way to get around that. So I was able to use a little bit of real life, combine it with a little bit of magic, and voila, Sinesis and the Ash King. And now, a word from our sponsor. This holiday season, the creators of Barbie Mermedia, Barbie Fairytopia, Barbie Myopia, and Barbie Die Hard bring you... In the depths of space, a confrontation is brewing between the forces of good. I'm Captain Barbie T. Doll, commandeering this vessel. An emergency situation has arisen, and I'm afraid you girls are going to have to grow up a bit early. And evil. For years, Barbie Doll abandoned us in the middle of a leaky toy box, crawling with roaches and dust mites. Captain Doll never bothered to check on our progress to keep the moths from eating our outfits. A battle with consequences for the entire galaxy. I will chase her around the Isles of KB, across the lot at Target, and FAO Schwartz's back room before I give her up. Barbie Star Trek, the Wrath of Ken. Skipper, no! All that, no! Spend not, no! 
<laughs> Ken, you bloodsucker! Ah, Barbie, you're still alive. My best girl. Yes, your best girl. You've managed to kill everyone else in the toy department, but like a potty training child, you keep missing the target. I... What do you mean? I mean, like the man who invented the Bratz dolls, you appear to be totally blind. Okay, I'm still not getting you. I'm saying you're going to have to come into Toys R Us if you want to kill me. Ah, Barbie, I've done far worse than kill you. I've messed up your hair and clothes. I will leave you as you left Jem in the holograms, abandoned and forgotten at the bottom of the discount bin. Buried alive! <laughs> Buried alive! Ken! Available this holiday season at your video store. And coming next Easter. Barbie, nine and a half weeks. Okay, welcome back. I hope everybody enjoyed the first of our Broken Mirror Story event stories. Yes, and I purposely didn't reiterate what the Broken Mirror theme was this year, just in case there's somebody that didn't know, and I didn't want to spoil it. But the theme for these three stories was a child is proclaimed king. Or queen. But it turns out to be more than just a game, right? Yeah, I believe so. And, you know, it was really fun the way that people interpreted those words, or people sp- the way people spun the idea. I'm so scared of that dang ghost now that I've got my back to it. <laughs> and, and one person that just blatantly cheated. So, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I also don't want to say too much because we've still got two more stories. But do you mind taking a minute and explaining how the whole judging process worked? Sure. On this Basically, we took these stories and we put them into a kind of a big group and we sent them out to our cadre. Cadre is how you say it, right? Submissions editor. That's how I would have said it. We sent these out to our cadre of slush readers that we have spread out across the United States and the world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and these people read the stories and as they do with any other story that gets submitted to the dune steve they gave it a score and we have them all rate them between a one and ten and so these people said ah, i give this story a seven i really liked how it was i gave this story a three it stank up the place it, i had to open the windows just to get the smell out all these scores were reported back to nicole our submissions editor and she tallied them all up she made a spreadsheet or something, too. Yeah, she made it all fancy and everything. And once everybody had read all the stories, she had us read each story as well. And we would send her our scores. And then she sent us the final tally. And uh, those that reached the top three is what we decided to be read on the show. It was surprising how close the final scores were. Yeah. There was probably only, you know, two points separating the the winner and the loot no that's not fair to say the the number one and the the number the bottom of the list right and by um, two points we're talking two hundredths we're talking like seven point two to seven point four kind of a thing not like seven to five no I was talking about seven to five oh sorry I was the loser so it's okay nobody's going to be hurt to know <laughs> that I was the well I'm going to be hurt but I've had time to prepare and and you know what it's our fault that it's this late and we're finally doing these big and I were the last people to say, okay, I was the last <laughs> person to send in my scores. I don't know why it took me so long, but uh, we're not too far. I mean, October we've always reserved for scary stories. So if we didn't get it in before October, then it was going to be after last year. We managed to sneak the episodes in just before October Although I think the last of the uh, Broken Mirror episodes may have been published on October 1st. And I've changed the date on the publication just so that it would fool people into thinking we got them all in in September. But, uh, you know, better late than never, right? I hope so. (laughs) Even Rish and I put stories in. And, uh, yeah, we didn't make it. 
Although I purposely tried to sabotage sabotage a few people's scores, and I still didn't make it. Well, last year, I think it was a lot more on our own heads, our, our, on our true. shoulders. We were the premier readers, and then I think we had a couple other people say, I'll read them all. And so I knew whatever I gave a really high score was probably going to be one of the winners. Mm -hmm. And this year, there was no knowing. I was just so surprised to see the spreadsheet, to see that there was a spreadsheet at all, but to see the results on the spreadsheet and go, wow, boy, they really didn't like my story, did they? <laughs> so that was fun. You know, maybe it was more of a uh, democracy as far as it went, as who got to be podcasted. And also we talked about well, how many are we going to do this year? Do you, do you want to do four? Do you want to do, do you want to just do the number one? Cause we're so behind and uh, I, I'm still not completely satisfied with how many we're doing, but boy, there's one that's so long that, yeah, it's kind of tuckered us out just to, to talk <laughs> about podcasting. Now. Yeah. Last year we actually did six stories. Oh I my think, Lord. Did we really? But a couple of those were very, very short stories. We had Kevin Anderson's poem, for example. <laughs> that that guy's we, uh, a big shot now, though. Yeah, he, he is. He wouldn't deign us with his presence now, now that he's no, the best-selling author of Night of the Living Trekkies, available on Amazon.com as we speak. That's right. But yeah, uh, we had his poem, which was 70 words or something like that. It was just tiny, and that counts as one of the six. And, and then the other one, there was one that was like 200 words or 100. It was like a Drabble cast there at the start of our show. So it's easy to get six stories in when some of them are as short as that. This time around, we didn't get any that were quite that short. So uh, we decided we would slash it back a few and just do the uh, three this time around. But I think it'll be fun. I'm excited to uh, hear how they turned out. And as we did last year, all the stories that were entered will be available to read as text on the site so you can go and look on the right side and there'll be a link that says broken mirror stories 2010 and you can go and you can read every last story because when it comes down to it that's the fun part that's the thing that makes the broken mirror story event so cool is to be able to see how many different things can be made from one premise and these people took that and ran with it in whatever direction they wanted to run and everybody can have the experience of being able to see just where all these people went with it. And me and you used to do this long ago, and we, we kept doing it through the years where we would toss out a uh, premise and we'd both write a story, and it was neat just to see the differences in the two of our stories. And sometimes the same things, like when we had the exact same title for both of our <laughs> stories that one time. But uh, now with 10, 12, I don't remember how many we had this year, but with several stories to read instead of just two you get that many more different visions and it's just fun it's really cool to be able to see and you can go and you can leave comments for these people on their stories on these pages and say yeah good job or whatever f you i hate you you know whatever it is that you want to leave as your comment and these people can see uh their story was appreciated and the work that they put into it was appreciated and that's cool this house is haunted so if you do write uh, you know f you and I didn't like your story, the ghost may very well remove your comment. <laughs> I, just, I, I need to warn you. That is possible, because it did try and dump a tree on our head last week when we were doing the That Gets My Goat episode. So watch out for the ghost. I, I didn't really mean that it was okay to say F you, I hate you to somebody's <laughs> story. It was just a, uh, just a joke. It was a toss-off joke. Okay, it failed. Sorry. Speaking of tossing off, why must you ruin? You're, don't you guys have anything interesting to talk about? Okay, so Senizas, Senizas, and the Ash King, and the Ash King. Uh, we've had difficulty the last three times. I think we've gotten together with ghosts, <laughs> and also with pronouncing words and and reading stories. Most of them are forthcoming, so I don't really want to spoil them, and I'll save the really embarrassing stuff for those episodes. But Liz was nice enough to give us a pronunciation guide on these names, and even with that, it was hard to say a couple of them, and uh, I don't think that that's a fault of the story. It's just she's trying to set it into a place that's unfamiliar. Right. Or, or a place that's in the past. Or a, a place magic that's foreign. place. A place so foreign, perhaps. <laughs> but it sometimes can be difficult and to keep all the names straight. All three of the family members started with C. I don't know. I'm not criticizing the story. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it to, to sound like I was. 
The criticism will come later. Uh, <laughs> you guys were nominated for a Parsec? There must have been some sort of a misprint. Have you ever read a science fiction book from the past when they used to have just unpronounceable names and there'd be like six X's and a W and then three in somebody's name? You'd just be like, ah! <laughs> three. Yeah, actually, I, th I find that to be a fun thing to do is to get one of those kind of books, read it yourself, and then give it to somebody that you know and have them read it and then try and talk about the book with them. You know, saying, oh, yeah, this character did this. And oh, yeah, I like this character doing that. But instead of saying this character using their names, and you'll find that never are the pronunciations of the two people. Like there was this Piers Anthony book that I, I read when I was younger. In this book, there's a character whose name is spelled M-A-C-H, right? So I read this and my sister read this. And then afterwards, we talked about it. And I was saying, oh, yes, this character Mock did this, and he did that. Mock, as in, like, the sound barrier. Right, M-A-C-H, that's how it's spelled. And my sister's like, oh, yeah, you mean Match. Yeah, Match did this, and Match did that. And I just, how could you say Match? But she got you on that because it was short for machine, and you hadn't realized that. I, no, I did know that it was short for machine, actually. But if it was short for machine, then I guess it would have to be Mush that his name was. <laughs> uh, but anyways, I don't know. I just thought it was so funny that. And recently, I, I've forced... I, I grabbed my wife by the hair and just jammed her face into this book until she, said, finally, Eat it. <laughs> she finally read the Robert Jordan books. For some reason, she just wouldn't do it. But I finally got her to do it. And once she got started, then, you know, she couldn't stop because that's just the way she is with books in general. But these books are really good. So, you know, you're going to go with it. Dude, these books are so chock full of crazy names like that. And... Every now and then, regular names are thrown in, which is always weird. But she'll talk with me, and, and, and I'll say, like, yeah, what's going on in the book now? Because, you know, I read them all. And it, but it's been a while, so I only kind of remember what happened to them. And uh, she'll say, oh, yes, this is happening, and this person and that person has said, that you know, and, oh, they're at this city. And every time she's pronouncing it some crazy way. And the funny thing about Robert Jordan books, they have glossaries in the back. I guess because they're so friggin' long and there's so many things involved in it, you have to sometimes go back there and, what the heck is this? And so you go to the back, oh, oh, okay. But with this glossary comes a uh, pronunciation guide. He actually will have a pronunciation guide on oh. some of these names. And originally, you know, they have these creatures that were, I called them the Trollocks because it was T R O O L L O C K S. It's a Trolllock. Right. And so I called it a troll lock. But then one day I looked at the back and it's actually supposed to be pronounced Trolloc. Eventually I changed the way I uh, thought of the name and I did the same thing with several other uh, things like that. And now I've been having arguments with my wife about that where she'll say, oh, yes, and the, the troll locks did this. And I'm like, no, 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 honey, here, come here, let me show you. I go to the back, see, it's this way. And she's like, no, I don't care. I don't care. I say troll locks. Troll locks sounds better than trollic. <laughs> Trollic sounds like my sister. You know, she's a trollic. Did you know what time she got home? What she stunk of when she got home? But but uh, yeah, I I just uh, it's so funny how that that's always the way it is with these invented names. It cracks me up every time. It's one of my favorite things to do with things like that. I I enjoy talking with my wife about this book just so that I can find something that she pronounces differently than I do, so that I can uh, bother her about it. Divorce papers will be going through soon, but, you know. Don't worry, folks. He'll have plenty more time to work on the show. <laughs> there you go. Warning. Today's episode contained comments from Rich Outfield. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, so you have children, and I don't. Right. If are you, are say, you waiting for something? What? Everybody's waiting for the next surprise. <laughs> I'm wondering if your response, reaction to this story was different than mine. Uh, maybe that's a stupid question. Maybe every person would just naturally rebel against the idea of sacrificing your child for the greater good. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe it's just a, a very male thing. Or maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's insulting to women because women are more protective of their children than men are, at least in the animal kingdom. But it, the idea of you're supposed to sacrifice your little girl 
so that the gods will be happy or the ghosts of the gods or the ghosts of your own, so the crops or so that it will rain, fill in the blank. That's so hard for me to get my head around. The the overwhelming need to kill <laughs> just fills me when I think of that. You want to kill somebody's child for the greater good? The greater good. The greater good. No, not at all. They just kill people around me at random people in to general? say this is what death is like. For the greater Enjoy good. Enjoy the greater good. The, greater good. <laughs> the, the, the biblical story of Abraham. Uh, Abraham was an old dude. And uh-huh. He was never able to have children. And his wife, Sariah, what was the? Yeah, I think it was Sarah. She was also elderly and they weren't able to have children. And then they, they have this miraculous kid. Like a kid that should never have been born, and his name was Isaac, and Abraham just loves this kid. And then one day God says, oh, blasphemy will alert, folks. Just give me a heads up. This is for you, Clay. God says, hey, Abraham, I know you've been a good follower and a good God-fearing guy, but I don't, I don't think it's enough. I don't think that you love me enough. I don't think you really love me, in fact. So I'm going to need you to kill Isaac. I, I, in fact, I'm going to need you to go up to a mountain and put him on a slab and kill him, you know, with a knife and to just, just, you know, sacrifice him to me, to show me that you are faithful, that you believe that you love me more than you love him. And Abraham being, you know, a devout man, he takes his boy or young man, depending on your interpretation of that story, up into the hills and the the son, and to me, this is the worst part of the story. And by worst, I mean hardest to hear. The son says, well, where is the, the sheep, dad, that we're going to sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. Sure. Okay, so they, so they get up there, and eventually the boy realizes that he is the sacrifice. But he allows his father to tie him, uh, and he puts him on this altar, and then Abraham gets his, his dagger out or his knife or whatever, and he, he raises it to, to slay the boy. And then I, I think an angel of the Lord appears or, or a booming voice or Keanu Reeves happens to uh, show up and say, whoa, whoa. He, he does. That says what he says. It's that's, weird. It's I, interesting that that's how you stop people is by saying, whoa, too. It's like a it's, horse. Yeah. yeah. It's surprising. And the Lord says, OK, hey, you've proven your worth. You've proven your loyalty, your fealty. What's the word? Your faithfulness? your faithfulness. Okay. You you don't have to kill the boy. Um, and here is an animal, and you can kill it as you know as a symbol. But but you've proven that you're a very faithful servant, and that, and Abraham is revered. I, I, the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham was a great man, a great prophet, a great follower of God. But uh, yeah, I, I guess when you hear these stories. And they're probably supposed to be parables in a way, right? Uh-huh. You know, you, you're supposed to think, what would I do? Would I be faithful? Would I follow this? Would I be willing to kill this? And maybe I didn't tell the story well and I wasn't accurate or anything. I was paraphrasing, obviously, in a little bit of a irreverent way or, or a lot, depending on your interpretation of my performance. But, you know, I, I, I don't know that I've ever read that story and thought – yeah, I could do that. I would kill my boy. I, I understand. I, I could do that. I could, I could murder my boy. <laughs> and, and, you know, we're banding about words, but that's what it is when you purposely take the life of another person and you don't have to. And so it was, it was a test and he passed the test. I couldn't pass that test. I couldn't live in, what was the town's called? I don't know if they ever in said the, the name of, of this Digimon, one. whatever. Deoden, they said, or Deo, Oh, Deoden is this the was near, the other town, town? Okay. but I don't think they ever said the name of this one. I'm sorry. Okay, I couldn't live in this town and do that. And the fact that this man can, I don't know. Maybe it says something about his faithfulness. Maybe it says something about his not being a hypocrite, because clearly he had been involved in this process before. But just the awfulness. Uh, the, the lottery system and the, and the weight and the time, the, the suspense of who has that rock, that's horrible. And then to know that it's your little girl uh, and she holds it up proudly. She doesn't even realize what it means. You as a dad, I'd be curious what your feelings are on that, on, 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 all, on that whole what would you do kind of scenario. Because, wow, I, I don't have a kid. I don't have that bond with a child to know this kid came from me. 
Uh-huh. When I'm gone, this kid is still going to be around to have my name and to remember me and to have his own family and all that stuff. That's, that's in, born in almost everybody's DNA. So, so I'm going to stop and let you talk for a minute. <laughs> but what, what are your thoughts and feelings on that? How did you feel with me telling the story? How did you feel when we were reading the story the first time you read it? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a really difficult thing to say. I mean, there's a lot of things that still go on. You you tell the story of Abraham, which is set somewhere deep in the past, you know, in a society that, that doesn't exist anymore and we don't understand at all anymore, really. Just, just the people making sacrifices at all. Sacrificing animals is something that we think is monstrous these days. But it was a commonplace kind of a thing. And there has been hundreds of societies throughout history in which human sacrifice was a common thing. You know, I've always wondered how true uh, some of these things are. Anthropologists or whatever have said that, like, the Mayans had the form of basketball that they say used to exist because they found hoops and kind of courts in these ancient cities that there's ruins of still. And... They always say, but in Mayan times, the losers were sacrificed to the god or whatever. And I just think, how do you know this? Is there blood stains from the sacrificing? I don't understand how they figure this stuff out. So I always wondered whether that's true or not. Okay, imagine that it is a basketball game to the death. And the opposing team comes on the court. And they're the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> it's like, oh, shoot. You're we're totally up. screwed. <laughs> like, oh, crap. I didn't know we were the Washington Federals or whatever the <laughs> fake team is that they play every time. <laughs> so I've wondered how they know that that's true. But th- that's beside the point. We know that there have been many societies throughout the past that sacrificed people to their gods to appease them. And I I guess most likely it's probably people that weren't able to defend themselves and the big powerful people were the ones that were doing the sacrificing, whereas the poor or something like that were the ones being burnt alive. So I guess it makes it easier to sacrifice somebody when they're the other. That kind of stuff still, in a way, goes on today when you talk about sacrificing yourself for the greater good. The greater good. In a different context, we have... For example, a war on terror that's going on. and In our country, it's a volunteer army still. They've done away with the draft, and these people are volunteering to go out and fight. Uh, and potentially die. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They're going out to fight to defend our country, to defend our freedoms and, and whatnot. And it's not just our country. I mean, there's several countries around the world that are in, involved in this fight with us. And, you know, these people are volunteering to go out for the greater good and very likely die in the process. That's a completely possible thing that my own child could do when he gets old enough. He could say, you know what, Dad, I want to join the army because I really think that I need to go out there and fight. And how am I going to feel about that? There are thousands and thousands of parents out there in this country right now that have children that have done this exact thing. And how do they manage? There are the people who would place explosives on their child and say, That's run, true. find a group of people that are our enemy, that are not like us, and set yourself off. Take as many of them with you as as you can. That's a form of human sacrifice, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Uh, especially when we're talking about children. But but I, that's beside the point. It's, but you're right. It does continue yeah, to happen Yeah, it's still right something now. that happens in a different fashion. Are you going to be like the people in this story who are, I guess, they're kind of like conscientious objectors or something. They're in, in a way, they found a way to sort of let their kid be sacrificed. But not really because the dog's ashes are what everybody drank and that it saved the girl's ashes to resurrect her in the pool of mystery. But but the father did kill the daughter. It wasn't a dog that he killed. Right. As far as he knew. I mean, not as far as he knew. He killed her. Right. Not knowing that magic could bring her back. True. It's possible that, that you don't forgive your wife for keeping that from you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's maybe the sort of thing that he could have been spared. The pain of, of thinking what he was doing was was real was, was irreversible. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's that's off the the track. I, I'm sorry. I still want to know your feelings and thoughts. And <laughs> my train of thought has gone off the tracks. 
but that's okay because I usually don't ever have much worthwhile to say. But yeah, I don't know if I can do that. I gave an example of, you know, my son said, okay, I'm going to volunteer for the army. I don't know how I would f- be able to deal with that, how I would feel about that. Okay, well, well, your wife comes to you and says, through magic, I'm going to bring our daughter back. Could you kill her knowing that she was going to be all right tomorrow or hoping that she was going to be all right tomorrow? Would, do you have it in you, <laughs> even if you knew she was coming back? To do that. I, I, I'm not saying, could you murder your kid? Because I know you, you couldn't murder your kid. But could you, quote unquote, murder your kid, knowing that it was reversible? You could bring her back through magic. I don't know. I, you know, to, to really know, that seems awful hard. It, you know, what, did they burn the, the girl in the story, right? Isn't that how they... So, yeah, that's pretty rough. I don't know if I could do that. What's interesting is that I guess we don't get a, a description of what happened after she was chosen until she is presented in the nice dress to be sacrificed. But do you suppose that the other villagers locked her up someplace where no one could get to her and her father couldn't get to her? Uh-huh. Uh, but, well, clearly she had been given this potion, this dulling of the uh-huh. – and and it seems like she might have been there with her mom and dad through the night. But uh, if it were me, I'd be in New Jersey before the sun came up the next day with my kid. <laughs> uh, I would flee to Canada, so to speak, to hell with the river and with this brat that you've chosen as the king. And you know, and maybe that means that I don't have a sense of community or or a sense of, of sacrifice for the greater good, the greater good, the needs of the many. Apparently, it outweighs the needs of the few. Or the one. Or the one. I, I, I don't know. I guess that says something about me. But we live in a society where we don't, for the most part, have to do that sort of thing. That's true. I mean, you think about the guilt that you carry around just from your kid getting hurt or, you know, your kid gets beat up at school or there's a car accident or something like that. And you're just like, oh, why, if I had only done this differently or if I, you know, kind of thing. And the death the the permanent loss of one of these childs is just that's something that would eat you up forever mm-hmm. or i'm sorry let me that would eat me up forever mm-hmm. you'll hear about these parents that their kids is in the back seat and they take them to work and they just leave them in the car forgetting you know they go into work or they go someplace go shopping and forget that their kid is there and the kid roasts they didn't mean for it to happen but that's it your life is over right I mean, even if you've got three more kids at home, I just can't see ever getting over that. Yeah. Just the realization of what happened and it was my fault. And maybe people are stronger than me. And if so, that that's great. But it's just a man's got to know his limitations and that's mine. Definitely. You know, the loss of a child is one of the toughest things to deal with. And it doesn't go away. There's a book. Uh, what's the guy's name? Richard Paul Evans, I think. He wrote, he wrote a, that Christmas thing? Christmas, Christmas box? box, I think it was called. But it's basically about someone who... Oh, it is the Christmas box? I think so. See, I was going to make a, a really, really dirty joke, but I won't now. Go ahead. <laughs> it's something like about somebody who has lost a child and there's a grave that's set up somewhere and it's like got a stone angel or something on this. Thing. I read in a magazine once somewhere where people were talking about these people that had read this book and then they came to the graveyard where this story was supposedly set in and they were looking for this grave because they wanted to go and mourn their own lost child that they had at well, I, this place. I don't were, understand. What was the significance of the grave? It had to do with the story and, and somebody who had lost a child and this, this grave was the grave. But it's not a pet cemetery kind of thing. That no, no. There's no, nothing coming back. You don't back resurrect. You it's just a way to be able to mourn or something like this. And these people that read this book, it resonated with them because they'd lost a child and they wanted to go and find this thing and be able to do the same as the person in the book did or something like that. I don't, I, I don't think I ever actually read the book book itself i just read the magazine article about it so can't get too in depth here but 
the, these people showed up at this actual cemetery where the book was set, and they went there, and they were really upset to learn that, you mean that this, it was fiction. This wasn't real. There wasn't a real grave that this was based on. Uh-huh. And so I guess eventually they got a collection together and made a real one so that people could come and do this because it happened enough. Because, you know, it's something that really eats people up. And even if it happened 40 years ago or something, it's still not something that you're going to forget. You know, I work in news and fairly often we'll have a story about a soldier who was killed abroad. And you get to see the images of these people who they were those parents that the child volunteered to go out into the military and they were the ones that had to go, oh, hopefully they don't get the stone with the, the weird symbol on it or whatever. You know, they're, they're praying that their children are going to be safe out there. And it turns out that they were the ones that had to be sacrificed for our freedom. And you see how hard it is on them when the casket comes back draped in the flag. And, you know, they, that, that's what they have left of their child. And it's something that I get to deal with fairly often. It's really hard even to just watch these uh, images and you know to see the hearse driving down the street and the procession that they do and you have the people lined up on the streets with their flags and and so forth they're paying homage to this person who was the one who sacrificed themselves for the greater good for the rest of us there's something really special and really important about that like i said before i don't know if i could handle being that parent i don't know how i would deal with that but I'm really deeply grateful for the people who do do this and and who sacrifice themselves for us. And and it's really uh, something that's very important. So I hope that, you know, I don't know if people are listening to this going, what? Support our troops, you loser. I definitely do. I know that what they do is something very important and necessary. And I'm very grateful that that happens. And maybe I'm too weak to be that person that that does the same. You never know sometimes what you're capable of when you're pushed to it. So if that was the only way to save my child, would I be able to wield the knife if I knew that they would, through magic, be revived later? Maybe I could if that was the only way, I guess. You never really know until you're actually faced with it. You know, one time I woke up in the middle of the night, right, and uh, I came out of my room and uh, went and got a drink from the fridge And at the same time that I did that, my wife had gotten up, and I thought she'd gone to the bathroom. It turns out she'd gone to the front of the house to do something, and I turned around, and I saw a person standing, and I was sure that someone had just broken into my house. And I came this close to putting my shoulder down and charging and tackling the crap out of my wife (laughs) because... Because I thought that she was an intruder in my house that had just broken in to do whatever. I would have never, ever in a million years expected that that would have been my reaction. That when I saw somebody that had broken into my house, I was going to go after them and take them down. And yet, when faced with the situation, that's the first reaction I had. Luckily, I realized it was her before I took her out. Because uh, that could have been bad. But, but imagine how that would have changed your life <laughs> if you had been like... Uh, take my wife just leave me alone <laughs> well no it's cool that you found out that you had a little metal <laughs> yeah i would have never expected it i would have assumed i would soil myself and i don't know what i would have done but it turns out that i was gonna sack the quarterback did you cry when he sacked the quarterback and nailed the chair <laughs> i can't so, believe you nailed him so hard, hard. that's a long time ago <laughs> You know, I was going to talk a little bit about the ending of this story. That was something that I had a conversation with Nicole about. You know, I was really surprised when she did the hair thing. But, you know, we'll just leave that for people in the comments if they feel like discussing the ending or or at any part or or feel like talking about losing someone or or what they are capable of doing or not or or just anything. It's it's fine. I, I like it when people talk in the comments and talk to one another and stuff like that it's fun to have comments was there anything else that you wanted to say about the story should we no i think i've uh, said my piece okay and then some okay so one one final thing about this story is uh we had our friend renee chambliss uh, Chambly. do the editing on this one and we had just mentioned that we were overworked and we had three of these to do in no time at all 
and she volunteered to edit one for us. Just out of the blue, she said, I'll get my kids to do the voices. I, it, it, really, really cool of her to do that for us. So thank you. You wouldn't be listening to this right now if it weren't for her. And your wife is getting up to go to work already. <laughs> thank you, Renee. She's got a uh, a marvelous voice, as you heard early in the story. And she did a great job. I think it turned out really well. So hopefully we can get her back for another. Huh? Oh, fat chance, man. <laughs> yeah, at the point of recording this, we don't know how hard a time she had with it. Uh, but, but we're going to be back with more stories on the same premise. That's right. There's two more to come. So get ready. And, and you know what? In 2011, we'll probably do it again. We'll do another Broken Mirror. That's right. Story of <laughs> They make for fun, fun stories. Yeah, that's one of my favorite events that we do. But there's really kind of two to choose from. Yeah, well, we'll see. But it's my f- the show evolves a little bit. Yeah. And uh, thank Maybe you we'll for... Maybe we'll come up with more events. I'd like to. But... Like the year-end sales event. That's always a good one. Black Friday. Yeah. The Memorial Day weekend sale. <laughs> there you go. Everything must go. <laughs> I'm just rambling, aren't I? Yes. Okay, folks, I've been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks for listening. Good night. Thanks for spending time with us. If you'd like to submit a story to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, put your story in the body of an email and send it to submissions at dunesteve.com. Please be sure to check out the submission guidelines first. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. And the Ash King by Lizanne Hurd. Good thing that she didn't use her actual name because I wouldn't have been able to pronounce that either. No, I think you were able to. It just I'm the one that couldn't. Oh yeah, but she I was. was she was tired of us taking the Mickey. Oh yes, we were taking the Mickey too many times. Now see, I'm, I'm sorry. I know you all want to hear the story, but screw you. Um, <laughs> to me, taking the Mickey, the a Mickey is a, a drug that you drop in somebody's drink. <laughs> uh huh. Right. I've heard a Mickey is actually a black and white mouse that wears red shorts with two yellow buttons. Uh, on see, the front. now that's a misconception. Steamboat Willie is actually a mouse. Uh, I've got nothing, folks. Not coming through, is it? There we go. How about Bide? You're coming through very good, Mr. Takei. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> oh, that was not the offensive part, by the way. That's still to come. <laughs> I'll put that in the outtakes, sir. That's all right. And every day about this time, he has to sing Belinda. Belinda, love you. And we're miss going to you. read Ash King you left first. Me, I don't know the words. Do you say it Paolo? You don't say it Paolo, do you? You say Paolo, right? In Spanish? Yes, but there's no Paolos like that. Yeah, it's P-A-U-L-O right. in Spanish, right? If, if there, it would be a Brazilian guy with a P-A-O, so... Right. We, we can, wouldn't say Paulo or whatever you say. say Paulo? But we'd say Paulo. 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 I guess it would be Paulo. Like the Italian Paulo, huh? <coughs> Paulo Bacigalupi. Bacigalupi! <laughs> All right, so who's reading which? Am I reading this one? Or was I reading the other one? I was reading the other one because you wanted to do Drunken Peter O'Toole for this one. Are we really doing Drunken Peter O'Toole? No. Wait, who, you is, can do, who is editing this? Uh, Renee. So she's going to hear all this stuff? Sure. If you, I'm not going to go through and edit it out. So if you're planning on saying all sorts of nasty things about her, stop that plan now. Can I say one nasty thing about her? Sure, go. No, no, I'll save it till some point oh. during the story. Oh, okay. All right, then. And you really want me to say the river? No, I did again. I don't want you to be drunk and pure. Four years and it meant one thing. 
I'd love to hear a whole story read in that voice. I want though. you to do it fairly normal. Wouldn't that be cool, though? No. <laughs> really? Okay. It would not be cool. It wouldn't last very long being cool, that's for sure. Renee thinks it would be cool. I can sense Yeah, she's her. saying that right now while listening, but it's too late. I've already overruled you. We can't, can't say for we've sure. We've got to not go overboard on these pronunciations, though. Otherwise, oh, it would no. derail us like it did on the <laughs> story, where you had to keep saying, oh, geez, it's supposed to be... These are fairly easy, though. The only one that's going to be weird is Calendra, instead of, I don't know, Calendra, or whatever you might say. Calendra. I, I Calendra, Gensa, Paolo. Paolo, I'd say that way anyways. Sindri, well, I'd probably say it that way, too. Deodar. We'd Deodar is when you might say Deodar, Deodar. but mm-hmm. Deodar, if you can remember that. Buran. Yeah, that's the fine. An, remember that is the way. And then Sinisas. Sinisas. Well, that's going to be the hard one for me. I don't know why. Sinisas. Do you have to say as? I'm not going to. Sinisas. I'm not going to, and Renee, don't have anybody else do that. I'm, I'm making an executive decision on this. I don't want it to say as. Just Sinisas. We're going to say the ass king instead. <laughs> That's right. Sin is ass and the ass king. <laughs> and go. Sinisus and the ash king. Oh, oh, that is right. Sorry. Wait, how would you say it? No, that's right. I forgot. I was thinking for some reason that it was Sinisas. Because <laughs> we kept saying that right there at the end. And then you said it differently. Sonny's ass and the... Okay. Four years in a row, and it meant one thing. King Yuntan? Yuntan. King Yuntan? Yuntan. Like he's from Utah, he's a Yuntan. Is that really what people from Utah are called? It is. Oh, that's not cool. <clears throat> not at all. King Yuntan had lost favor with God, and his wife and another king must be chosen. Wait. He'd lost favor with wi- with God and his wife? Yes. Wait, God's wife or his own wife? His own wife. Okay. <clears throat> his wife is the ghost that he's supposed to be faithful to. And if he's not faithful to it, then he loses favor and then the river stops. And But God and his wife, they're still together, right? <laughs> or are they estranged? I, I have been not been keeping up. <laughs> okay. It's fine. I'm sorry. I don't know how to pull off that sound effect. Okay. There seems to be some kind of popping noise in these microphones. (laughs) That's our special cue that tells you that it's chapter break. I'm going to say that again. It just seemed a little strange. When you get to it, (coughs) Calendra. What did I say? No, I'm just saying when you get to it. Calendra. Making me paranoid, sir. His wife, Calendra, covered with the symbols of her family's trade, he had four-year-old Sinisas. I think you just have to make it a Sinisas. I have overruled Spanish. That. Spanish pronunciation. I have overruled that. Here no, you, re- you overruled as. But you can say whatever you want. It it's was just, Sinisas that you said, oh, we're not saying that, we're look, saying there's, Sinisas. There's too many weird words with pronunciations. I don't... Can't we just say what feels natural? You say what you want, man. You're the you're the one in charge, right? I am. His wife, Calendria. Calendra. Ah, see what you did there? Cover your ears, Renee. I'm about to call him a douche. You... His wife, Calendra, covered with the symbols of her family's trade, hid four-year-old Sinisas in the folds of her voluminous... I'm going to say voluminous instead of the real (laughs) word. You're just going to overrule that? I don't care what dictionary.com says. (laughs) I'm in charge. (laughs) Power trip. Uh Uh-oh. You're supposed to be an old man. I'm not. I'm the old man. The king has been the king for 38 years. Yep. And I did an old man voice and you didn't. That's what I'm saying. Oh, you don't care. No wonder we lost the parsec. Oh, you just shorted your mic out. Are you back? Yeah. Is that how it's said? I'm young again. See, it's okay. Oh, you loophole. Ah, you be the wife. Sleep. Sleep. 
Sleep. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just, I was thinking maybe I should be the wife since you and I would have lots of conversations, but it doesn't matter. I don't think we will. We're already, I think, to the part where they choose the king or whatever, and there's not much of. Okay. Do you want to whisper something? Go and sit down, all right? Just keep that stone to yourself in your pocket and stuff. Don't play with it. Stop playing with a stone. Hey, they're not those kind of stones. Stop playing with them. Tiny squeals of happiness flittered through the coverings of the young girls as their boyfriends returned to them unkinged. Do you want to make a tiny squeal of happiness that she won't ever use? <laughs> no. Is it Graham as in American or Graham like the Brits say it? Oh, should it be Graham? No. You can say it like you would say it. Okay, well, let's decide if it's Graham or oh, Graham. Graham. I decided. There you go. Okay. Graham, Graham, the Ash King, may he live forever. Is that what everybody says? Yeah, this is an everybody thing. Ready? One. And it is Graham. Yes. Okay. One, two, three. Graham, Graham, the Ash King, may he he live forever. One, two, three. Graham, Graham, the Ash King, may he he live forever. forever. That was kind of dumb. One one more time. One, two, three. Three. Graham, Graham, the Ash King, may he live forever. These chairs are really creaky. Probably ought to sit on something else. I don't know. I feel like I'm making too much noise. Sit on this. There you go. Hold it between your palms. Keep that one between your palms. That, sh- <laughs> that shouldn't be funny. <laughs> I don't know why it is. He bent down on one knee. Uh, That's all he had to say. Hey, this is for Renee. Uh, You can cast whomever you want if you have people to do voices. I would probably want you to be the wife. Um, uh, Unfortunately, you're already married, so you can do like the main female character in this story if you prefer. Um, (laughs) These are some kind of deities, I believe. Yeah. Where's your God now, Moses? Uh, See? See? He breathed deep and let it out slow through his nose, limp. I do not have limps. You will if you keep talking back to me. A murmur twittered through the crowd. Twitter? Really? Oh, wait, that actually is a word, isn't it? People got onto their phones and started going, Blackstone, Blackstone. A murmur text messaged through the crowd. I couldn't pull it (laughs) off. I'm sorry. He reached for Jensa, who opened her palms to him. He covered her hands, obfuscating. Say it? Obfuscating? Uh, Obfuscating. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. It's fine. I just have never used the word. I just want to see. Uh, Can we get a little dictionary.com music, please, Paul? Paul? Hey, where is Paul? Maybe he hasn't shown up either. Dang. Him and Announcer Man are both skipping out on us today. I hope they're not lovers. (laughs) He covered her hands, obfuscating their... Now you said foo. Did I? Yes. Foo you. Mm Mm-hmm. He covered her hands, obfuscating their... Obfuscating, right? Yeah, obfuscating. You said it right. It's hard! Didn't want to continue after you're done. (laughs) Ew. (laughs) Now, okay, I'm going to make a little friendly wager here with you. Mm -hmm. I got $5 right here. This is the sound of $5. $5 says... Renee can make spitting sound attractive. Oh, um, I don't know if I'd be willing to wager on that. Because I would have probably wager on the same side. That doesn't really work. Doesn't a bet require two people betting on opposite things? Okay. I bet she probably wouldn't go... <laughs> like I did, though. Okay, but let's say that Renee was getting over, like... A, a summer cold. Okay. And she was really, really phlegmy. It is November. It's, it's, can you have a summer cold in November? Anyhow, <laughs> she closed the curtain and spat on the floor. Uh, you're the wife, right? Does it matter? Who's the wife? This is me, not the wife. You sure? She yes. touched his face. Okay, say it. Her name is Calendra. She wouldn't be saying her own name like that. I'm going to Calendra you right in the nuts. There's a question I was thinking the other day. In a case like that, do you capitalize love? 
Um, because it's a pet name. Hell no, Big Anklevich. Like honey. Do you capitalize honey when you call somebody honey? Uh, hell no, Big Anklevich. Okay, what about babe? Hell <laughs> no, Big Anklevich. Who let that guy in here anyways? An announcer man hasn't showed up, but mildly offensive guest star has showed up. <laughs> is that what his name was? I love that. Where, where, where has been, he been all these? <laughs> no wonder I've been so lonely. And a powder, Calendra, could... I'm, that's right. I'm here. No, you're not. Damnation. Instant let's, breakfast. Let's do this. <laughs> Damnation. Instant breakfast. You're gonna love it in an instant. Even licking the sticky sides of the cup when the liquid was gone. That's quite enough of that. Should I do that again? Seems fine. Are you farting or was it really bad? It's this darn chair. Oh, sure. It's the chair. It's always the chair. (laughs) Chair make that smell too? I'm going to say Graham instead of Graham. Okay. Okay. I'll make an executive decision right now. Graham is what we're going with. You're going to thug it in an instant. Graham was thrust forward, still grinning. That's what she said. Thrust! Thrust forward, still grinning. Graham was thrust forward. Do you understand, Graham? Oh, crap. Do you understand, Graham? Hell no, Sindri. But just, you know, one of those uh, where you get this far away right. from somebody and just... Should I whisper it? I've seen you kiss miserable curs in your yard. Huh? If you want to, yeah. Huh? <laughs> the emotion is more important than the volume, so. Okay. Acting! Brilliant! Thank you! What kind of a Paolo? What should Paolo be? Is he older? Calendra! Oh, darling, it's so good to see you. He pulled in... That's still a little silly, don't you think? Do you think she'll get somebody else to do it? Probably. I don't know. Be best if she did, but... Anytime I'm doing a second voice, it's best to get someone else to do it. I could do something like, Calendra, oh, darling, it's good to see you. That's one of my few voices that I can replicate again and again. <laughs> um, or I could do my Kermit the Frog voice. No, no, don't do Kermit the Frog voice. Ready? Calendra, oh, darling, it's so good to see you. What oh, do you think of my Kermit the Frog voice? That's just laughable. <laughs> Say hi-ho. But hi-ho. Why don't you? Yeah, oh, darling, it's so good to see Stop you. Stop it, man. I, it's not easy being green, I understand, but... Okay, I'm going to try this again. A large fountain with a waiting pool... A large fountain. Say it with a T. A large fountain. Yeah, I don't know why I can't. I guess I'm from a place that says mountain. A large fountain with a wading pool. Is that correct? Fountain? Fountain. Ah, you said it in the T. No, that's with a T. Fountain. Douche! Fountain is how you say the word. A large fountain with a wading pool dominated the center of the garden. Changing narrators. Bloopers! <laughs> Balooper! <laughs> we don't intentionally record bloopers. Unless mistakes happen to be made. <laughs> Balooper! Okay. okay. What? Right. Now you are the Ash King, and you are. Sad because you just realized what's happening to little Sinisa. So you say, I am the Ash King in a sad way. Okay. I am the fart king. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, Mom. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>